Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this state funeral for Faith Bandler AC. My name is John Faulkner and as someone who knew Faith for over 40 years, it is my honour to be your Master of Ceremonies today. Could I ask you please to stand? Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. We are joined at this state funeral service by Faith's family and many distinguished guests from all walks of life. I welcome Faith's daughter, Lelon, son-in-law, Stephen, granddaughters, Olivia and Nicola, and her niece, Charlotte. I acknowledge His Excellency, the Honourable David Hurley, Governor of New South Wales, and Mrs Hurley, Group Captain Graham Davies, representing the Governor General, Senator the Honourable Nigel Scullion, representing the Prime Minister, the Honourable Shane Newman, representing the Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Barry O'Farrell, representing the Premier of New South Wales, the Honourable Linda Burney, Deputy Leader of the Opposition in New South Wales, the Honourable Justice Virginia Bell, the Honourable Tom Bathurst, and Professor the Honourable Dame Mari Bashir. We're also joined by many Indigenous leaders, members of the South Sea Islander community, 
and uh, by members of state and federal parliament, past and present, and by representatives of the diplomatic corps. Ladies and gentlemen, we gather today to celebrate the life of Faith Bandler, author, advocate, and activist. You will hear from our speakers about Faith Bandler's extraordinary achievements, her monumental contribution, her tireless dedication, and her exceptional commitment. Many have said in recent days that she is and should be an example and an inspiration to us all for what she did, and that is so true. But Faith Bandler should also be an example and inspiration for how she worked, as well as what she achieved. She built powerful coalitions, alliances both enduring and contingent, working relationships based on personal friendships or shared goals, her ability to reach across boundaries of race, class, politics and opinion in the pursuit of her great aims was at the heart of her successes. Her life stands as a testament to how much one person can do to change the country they live in and the world they leave behind. And now, Professor Shane Houston, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Indigenous Strategy and Services at the University of Sydney, will acknowledge country. It is my honour today to offer an acknowledgement of country. And this is not a mechanical thing. It is not a perfunctory gesture. It is something that has been part of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's lives for tens of thousands of years. It is a connection between us here today and ceremony and tradition and people stretching back tens of thousands of years. Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, this was their country. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across this great land had ceremony both to welcome and to send off. If I were in Western Australia, I might burn a grass tree to welcome you to country. And in parts of New South Wales, ceremonies would be held in Bora rings. But as I said, our ceremonies were not just about entering, but they were also about leaving. Entering and leaving territory and entering and leaving life. In parts of our country, you might be covered in ash to welcome life to country, while in other parts, you might be covered in white ochre to send off family who have left us. Ceremony is critical. It draws people, land, spirit, life, and journeys together. Gadigal, in this land around us now, taught, held ceremonies to welcome and to mark the progression of life, and importantly also, to send off. All of us here today join Gadigal people in this, in this centuries-long tradition. We hold our sorry business here now. And we remember just as they have done for centuries. On behalf of us all, I'd acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and do so that we might add to this long tradition of connecting people, spirit, land and ceremony in welcome and in farewell. And can I say, Lilon, all of our hearts ache with you. And can I say to old girl here, thank you, thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I invite you to join friends of the Bandler Llewellyn family, uh, directed by Luke Burke, accompanied by Amy Johansson in the singing of the national anthem. Please be upstanding. be seated. Today, four speakers, Linda Burney, Paul Tozillo, Anne Summers and Lelon Bandler will all speak about Faith Bandler. Our first speaker is Linda Burney. Linda is a politician and an Aboriginal woman with an extraordinary life story of her own. She was 10 years old when the 1967 referendum was passed by an overwhelming majority of the Australian people. She knew faith and I know was admired by faith for her strength and purpose. The Honourable Linda Burney. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Shane, for your acknowledgement of country. You have performed a very ancient protocol, and I join you in that acknowledgement. I recognise uh, the many dignitaries, fellow travellers, friends here today, and in particular, of course, Lilon and your family. Be sure the love of a nation travels with you today, and it always will. Faith Bandler was born in 1918. She's of a generation honed by two world wars, depression, and terrible discrimination. Just recently, we farewelled another hero from that era, of course, Tom Uren. It was a generation of extraordinary people. Faith was a child of the world, born in northern New South Wales on the Tweed, Ida Faith Lessing Mussing, whose story reflects what our country's story really is, 
but up until recently, not taught. Faith was a woman of grace, and she was a member of many organizations, which reflects the seminal role she had in writing and helping to pen the true story of our nation. The Australian Fellowship, Aboriginal Fellowship back in 56, the Federal Council of Advancement for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, the Cooperative, Cooperative for Aborigines and Islanders, the Australian South Sea Island United Council, the Union of Australian Women, and many, many more. She travelled Europe in the wake of World War II and was changed for it. And I believe I've just learned she was a marriage celebrant, which I didn't know until today. But friends, today I want to speak about grace. Grace is an intrinsic quality at the core of a person. Grace in response to accolade and acclaim, but also when faced with indifference, ignorance and hostility. Grace is the quality I associate with Faith Bandler at all times and in all circumstances, in public and in private. We have all witnessed it over many years. I've been a recipient of it on occasion and I've marvelled at, at, it, at it as a quality that can't be conjured up, it cannot be faked. Grace must be genuine, it must be organic. In faith, grace was personified. As a young Aboriginal woman making my way in the world and learning, uh, learning about the struggle for human rights in this country, I had many Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal leaders, male and female, for me to lean on, leaders that showed me the way. And there was Faith Bandler, an extraordinary humanitarian of South Sea Island heritage and others, a sister, a mother, an aunt, who worked with Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in the fight for recognition for equality under law and across society and for true and lasting reconciliation. In 57, the year I was born in country New South Wales, people like Faith, Aunt Pearl Gibbs, Jessie Street, Alan Duncan, Dulcie Flowers and many others, some of you here today, began the campaign for a national referendum to alter the constitution and give the Commonwealth the power to enact laws for the benefit of Aboriginal people. As I said, I was 10 years old and I'd lived my life as a young Aboriginal girl and like other Aboriginal people in this, in this room, not counted in the national census and not existing in our own country. Faith said of that campaign, or one of the things, was getting people to see Aboriginal people as people. I don't remember the referendum exactly, but I do remember that election. There was something different about it. And that day in May, this country's constitution was changed. Voting was a very important event in the house I grew up in. My, on election day, my great aunt and uncle dressed up in their best clothes. A tie was worn and a hat, and they went to cast their votes. I believe my great aunt and uncle, non-Aboriginal people caring for me, cast their vote as yes, bravely as 99.77% of the rest of the Australian population did. The Australian story changed because Australia, Australia had voted for change. It was eight years later at Charles Sturt University that, I, that this was not an abstract thing for me. It was that yes vote for many of us that gave us the chance to step into the light. Before that, we were something, and after that, citizens. As I learned more about the historic campaign, everyone, and the changes it had brought, you could, not, be, you could not, be, not, not be drawn to that smiling, beautiful, small, wonderfully spoken, quietly consistent, brimming of grace, Faith Bandler, who again and again, at every opportunity, to Menzies, to Gorton, to Holt, handed out leaflets with her colleagues and fellow travellers, 
spoke at rallies, had tea with prime ministers, but friends for 10 years. We can take three things, I think, from this woman of grace and her life, her leadership and humanity throughout that historic campaign and apply them to our own thinking and development. The first is, of course, you can't pick and choose who you'll work with, what government will be sitting on the Treasury benches. You cannot wait for the time it suits you. You have to work with all. Historic change means working with whoever is in front of you and bringing them with you, of course, as this woman of grace did. The second lesson, you have to play the long game. You have to have stamina to survive, as this woman of grace also did. Stamina, heart and commitment. And lastly, that argument for change delivered with honesty, with integrity and with grace will win the long game and will bring people with you. The campaign for the referendum was a lesson to us all on how to play the long game, to not lose sight of the goal, to press the case. It's a lesson we in the Aboriginal community have learnt the hard way through the referendum, through land rights and native title, and through the ongoing involvement of the reconciliation process, often at great cost. And we take these lessons into the argument for constitutional change through the recognised campaign. I know what Faith's advice has been, play the long game. We have learned and honed our skills over the decades, and we all of us acknowledge the leadership, the com commitment and the tenacity of all those who led the referendum campaign, none more so passionately than Faith Bandler. Remarkable, humble people who have love for humankind and the love we have for them. Always welcoming, always smiling, encouraging, telling us young women, Kate Faith did, how proud she was of us, how important the work we were doing was and the difference we were making. She held your hand and looked into your eyes with those smiling eyes of hers, bursting with pride making you feel special, reminding us not to lose sight of the end goal, to keep playing the long game. Faith's hands were always warm, they were always soft, and when she held yours, she passed on comfort, confidence and love with her touch. In 92, the Mabo decisions destroyed the fiction of course terra nullius in this country. Aboriginal pe people had rights due to them from the very beginning of the first sunrise. The reconciliation process, the final, rec final recommend recommendation from the Royal Commission into deaths and custody created the Reconciliation Council. It was a council of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people from all walks of life. And I remember being part of organising the 97 Reconciliation Convention. Faith Bandler was part of this movement, an elder, an advocate providing wide counsel, wise counsel as we sought to bring the whole country with us on the journey for reconciliation. That convention in 97 was to endorse a roadmap that would take this country forward. It was at the convention that I was struck like a bolt of lightning from Faith's words, clear and unambiguous. She said to us, there are dark clouds gathering. The recognition of native title, the Bring Them Home report, the recognition of the Royal Commission, systemic racism, discrimination, it all brought a terribly fierce backlash from sections of the Australian community, a backlash you will all remember. Indeed, the dark clouds that Faith predicted were passing over the map of Australia. Talkback Radio was aflame with threats of people losing their backyards. But Faith Bandler stood tall at the 97 Reconciliation Convention in front of the then Prime Minister and uttered these words, dark clouds are gathering. It struck me as I'm sure it struck everyone in the room. It was a warning and a prediction from someone who had the wisdom and the experience to recognise a backlash. And as we know, she was right. After the hope and joy 
and promise of the reconciliation process came a decade of principled, adamant struggle. There would be no apology and the winding back of native title. But the wonderful thing, and Faith was part of this too, as you all were, was those thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of Australians that walked across bridges and voiced their support for the long game. Faith, Faith Bandler called it, the, called it at the Reconciliation Convention and stood with all of us for the next 15 years as Australians from all walks of life worked together to keep the movement alive. And in the recognised campaign, we now see that continuing. What was started in 57, that historic campaign, led those by, by those incredible men and women and that child of New South Wales, Faith Bander, Bandler, lives on today. As I said, I began my education about this history at university. I had 12 years of schooling and not once spoken to about these truths. What Faith and her colleagues did and what else they meant in their hearts for this country was not part of the story. But what is, um, what is wonderful now, it is part of that story. The truth about invasion, colonisation, stolen children, stolen wages, stolen land. And as Faith knew well, truth liberates and unites us all. But sometimes learning that truth is hard and understanding what, is, what has happened is incredibly important. Finding a point of acceptance and forgiveness one can use to mark a line in the sand is very much a lesson from this woman of grace we come together to celebrate today. She stands tall in having this history told and acknowledged. As a country of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, we owe her a debt of gratitude that perhaps cannot be repaid. But I would like today to acknowledge Faith's own family history, her South Sea Islander heritage, her call for the story of the South Sea Islanders to be told in the history of this country in the way that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history is now told, of peoples taken from their islands, of Vanuatu, the Solomons, and many others, brought to this country as Faith's father was, uh, Wackvi Mussington, blackbirded as a boy, sold into slavery. His story is the story of many families up and down the east coast of New South Wales and Queensland, a key factor in the establishment of sugarcane in this country. Free labour, slave labour, stolen people, stolen wages. Blackbirding is part of our story and Faith and Lilon and her family are testament to that. Faith Banda taught us how to face the challenges of history, of truth-telling and honesty, and she taught us how to do it with grace. Her legacy is shared by all Australians. She had a fabulous sense of humour and described Asio as as those horrible little snoopers. She leaves us better as a people and as a nation. She is forever to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, our sister, our aunt, our aunt full of grace, Faith Bandler. From New South Wales, Australia and the world. And I think the final word today in my contribution should come from this woman of grace herself. And she said this, I'm a great believer in the power of people and I think you know I'm a street woman. I believe we should make good use of the streets. They are not just there for motor cars, they are there for us to get out and, in, and express our feelings on how we feel, particularly about war, about peace, about manufacturing of arms, the banning of manufacturing arms and so on. And I finished with this in her words as well. And so my faith is in people. And I can't say anything else other than that. It always has been and it always will be. Well, we had a meeting on the site and uh, Robeson was introduced to the workers and he spoke about his relationship with the workers in other countries uh, because he was a, 
a prominent figure in the international working class movement. next speaker is Paul Dorzillo, who has known Faith Bandler and her family all his life. He's been involved in research, policy and service implementation in Aboriginal health since the 1970s. He joins us now to share his memories of Faith, Professor Paul Torzillo. Thanks, John. Good morning. Although I'd seen Faith and I'd been in meetings with her, I first really met her in 1976 when Heather and I decided to get married. And at that stage, our lives were so enmeshed in Aboriginal families and communities that it seemed the natural thing to do. Um, in addition, our so-called best man had been scathing about the fact that we needed to have the forces of the state to acknowledge our relationship. And so we thought getting faith might help claw back a little bit of our left-wing credentials. Um, so we had a ceremony under the gum trees with families from, I thought about this on the weekend, every town from Moree to Wilcannia along the Darling and, Darling and Barwon and a few others, few others in, as well. In the middle of poignant words from Faith, our great friend Aubrey Weatherall from Collar Inabri, who'd been celebrating our marriage from early on that day, <laughs> lunged through the crowd, um, shouted out, 
I love you all, and then flung himself towards us, missing me by six inches and crash tackling Heather to the ground. With the grace of Pele and the timing of an opera singer, Faith just put a left hand down, steadied his shoulder while a couple of young blokes came and picked him up and then she proceeded with the ceremony. Now, although this is a story about Faith's grace and elegance that everybody knows, that's not the point of the story. The, the point of the story is that she was completely comfortable with a big mob of blackfellas, most of whom she'd never met. And secondly, they were completely comfortable with her. And as Isabel Flick, another great Aboriginal activist, said to me that night, she's solid, eh, Paulie? And she was. Of course, these are qualities that most leaders and activists today would give their eye teeth for. And you see, you can feel that quality again when you read faith stories about her meetings and organising with Joe McGuinness, Kenny Brindle, Pearl Gibbs. These, these were famous names when I came into the scene. And you can see in her words affection and admiration and comradeship. Of course, while Faith might have been born to be a leader and activist and had a natural talent, she also went to finishing school. So in the 1950s, she meets and she's mentored by a raft of incredible women, like the likes of Jessie Street, Lucy Woodcock, women who were giants for social justice, but whose involvement in the peace movement and others had linked them to many people in many countries around the world. They had links with the women's movement in India already at that time and were working with left and progressive women's groups there and elsewhere, and particularly for Lucy Woodcock. They were people who were astutely aware of issues of race and class. This was the grounding for someone who became much more than an advocate for Aboriginal rights. Faith at her core was an internationalist. She was someone who took lessons from social justice movements around the world and in her time created lessons for them. Faith's victory with the 67 referendum and with people who are, some of whom are still here, Dulcie, um, as had already been said, is a landmark for progressives in this country. But it's critical to recognise that Faith then went on to support and give advice to a raft of progressive and social justice issues for the rest of her life. It's hard to find a key progressive activist in the last 40 years who didn't interact with Faith, seek her advice and her counsel. Of course, in this, Hans Bandler was critical Here's an environmental engineer decades ahead of his time. He had a deep understanding of fascism in Europe, of politics, and he was someone who's not just a soulmate, but an intellectual mirror. Um, just as a point of clarification for the, any Murdoch columnists who happen to be here, they were lefties, we're proud of it, and we're claiming them. Um, faith never played a stereotype role. Formulaic rhetoric was not for Faith. When she was talking, she was thinking. One of the biggest challenges of her life, obviously, but also one of her strengths, was that she was a South Sea Islander, a black activist, but not Aboriginal. She never took a soft option on those facts. In characteristic fashion, she took the debate forcefully and eloquently to people who had a different view. In retrospect, I think that was one of her greatest achievements. Um, 
On the weekend, I was thinking about this and talking to a few people, and I talked to Terry Witters and asked him if he had anything to say about faith. He said, lots. For anyone who doesn't know Terry, he's one of the seminal Aboriginal thinkers of our time. He tells the story of the 18-year-old Aboriginal kid who hitches a ride from Armidale to Sydney because he's heard about a meeting that had something to do with Aboriginal rights and it was going to be at Sydney University. He gets there, he's quietly up the back and a woman introduced as Faith Bandler stands up to talk. She was poised, assured, and a bit done up. Not a lot, but a bit, he says. Not what he was used to. But she was quite black poor. As she started to speak, the conviction of her words filled the room. He says, they gave contextual meaning to all the issues that I was struggling with. She was at the core of her words, Terry says. It was clear she was not pissing around. He says, it changed for me the vision. Firstly, she was black, she was self-assured, she was clear, and she was passionate about her conviction. She provided a benchmark for seriousness that served me for the rest of my life, he says. From that day, he remembers, I wanted to hear more said about these issues and I wanted them said in that way. She clarified the need for direction for action and for an international perspective. I can't do better than Terry's words. Um, I'll just close by saying that there are occasional special people who are torch carriers for social justice. They gather the torch from their predecessors, they carry it through their generations and they pass it on to as many people as they can. When you meet them, you feel better about humanity, you feel better about yourself. They energise you to work harder, think better, think bigger and be better. Faith was one of those people and we're all much better for it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Friends of the Bandler Llewellyn family, directed by Luke Byrne, will now sing for us, Meet Me in the Middle of the Air.
Our next speaker is Anne Summers. Anne is a journalist, editor, publisher, writer, and pioneering feminist. Anne will pay tribute to Faith Bandler's activism on behalf of women. Dr. Anne Summers. Friends of Faith, I'm going to talk today about faith and feminism. I'm going to pay tribute to a part of Faith Bandler's life that is not as widely known as many of the other things for which she is rightly famous and for which she is remembered and honoured. Fighting for women's rights was a constant in Faith's political life. And as with everything else she did, Faith's feminism was very focused and very political. However else she defined herself and what other causes she adopted, and of course there were very many over her long life, Faith's feminism was intrinsic to who she was, even when other people overlooked this or are even totally unaware of it. There were times in her life, some of them difficult times, when being a woman became her primary definition of her identity and herself. And as with many of us, for faith, being a woman and being a feminist were synonymous. Faith had the standard 1970s feminist bookshelf. Jermaine Greer's A Female Eunuch, Doris Lessing's novels, my own book, and perhaps most important of all, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. This 1963 work was one of those landmark breakthrough books. After you'd read it, the world was never the same. For many women, it was a life-changing work, and it seems to have been so for Faith. She and a group of friends would meet together every week to talk about a different chapter in the book. Faith's copy of The Feminine Mystique was underlined and things were written in the margins and it was very well read from cover to cover, her daughter Lelon told me. Not really like her at all. Faith was of a generation who considered it permissible to write one's name on the title page or frontispiece in a book and in Faith's case to note read once she'd completed it, but that was all. She rarely wrote in them, Lelon said. So this book meant a lot to Faith. Now, I had the opportunity late in Betty Friedan's life to ask her, looking back, how she defined herself. First, I am an American, she told me. Second, I am a Jew. And thirdly, I am a woman. Now, I do not presume to know how Faith Bandler would have answered that same question, but I think it's very likely that she would have thought of herself in terms of her nationality, her race, and her gender. Whether she would put, have put them in the same order as Betty Friedan did, I cannot say. But I think what I can say is that for Faith, her race, her gender, or as we used to call it, her sex, were inextricably intertwined. When we think about the life of Faith Bandler, we should remember this. She was the daughter of a slave who was married to a Holocaust survivor. She might have lived on the North Shore and shopped at David Jones, but she was intimately aware from the experiences of those close to her of the terrible episodes of kidnapping and genocide that are part of our recent past. Faith was also a woman of colour living in Australia, who was neither Aboriginal nor a Torres Strait Islander. Her colour, combined with her politics, made her a person of interest to Australia's domestic intelligence agency. ASIO started its five-volume file on the young Faith Mussing in 1950, initially because of her involvement in the peace movement, and would continue to have her under surveillance until 1977. In the beginning, ASIO could not figure out if Faith was Aboriginal or a Negress. In July 1950, a memo to the director advised 
The young lady who spoke at the meeting and who I described as a negress was, in capitals, Faith Mussing. There is a handwritten annotation. She is not a negress, but, but a Polynesian, a very different thing. A few weeks later, another memo quotes electoral particulars that state she was born in Mwilimba. They were wrong about that too. Um, so there is some doubt as to her being of the politician type. Sorry, the poly beg your pardon. There is some doubt as to her being of the Polynesian type, unless the writer of the memo mused, unless she was born there of Polynesian parents and lived in that area for some time. It's noted on another page that Mussing's parents had worked for Mr. Anthony, MHR. Perhaps this connection deterred ASIO for a time. After all, Larry Anthony was the famous country party patriarch whose son Doug and grandson Larry went on to hold his federal seat in parliament, thereby establishing one of Australia's preeminent political dynasties. But in 1952, the racial commentary resumes, with Faith described in another ASIO memo as not a full-blooded white. <laughs> then, in a report on Australians attending a youth festival in Berlin in 1951, Faith Mussing is described as partly Polynesian and partly Indian, and it is possible that one of the grandparents was a Kanaka. She is age 34 but looks younger, writes an ASIO commentator, and it is considered that the colour of her skin caused her to swing towards the peace movement. Well, ASIO was right about that. The colour of Faith's skin was a major factor in radicalising her. If you have been discriminated against, ostracised, marginalised, and in all sorts of ways being treated differently because of your skin colour, in all likelihood, you are going to want to change the world that treats people of colour that way. Similarly, if you have been discriminated against, patronised, paid less, and in all sorts of ways treated differently because of your gender. If you have experienced both, you are a powerfully motivated person. And Faith Mussing indeed experienced both. When she and her sister Kath joined the Women's Land Army in 1942, as replacement labour for the men who had enlisted in the war. Along with the other young women, they were sent to work on farms in New South Wales. Faith later commented how, as women, they had been exploited, being paid less than men and receiving no additional benefits after three years of service. She also noted that the Aboriginal workers, women and men, were paid less than she and the other young women were. I found myself thinking about the Aborigines for some reason or another, she wrote many years later in what would turn out to be a moment of awakening for her. Faith Bandler's triumph in the 1960 referendum and her active involvement in a number of Aboriginal organisations led many Australians to assume that she was Aboriginal. In fact, as Aboriginal politics became more radical in the 1970s, non-Aboriginals were excluded from organisations that had once welcomed members who were white, as well as those whose dark skin came from different ancestries. In 1975, Faith made a submission to the Royal Commission on Human Relationships on the discrimination and exclusion suffered by South Sea Islanders. She used as an example the exclusion of people like herself from the newly formed National Aboriginal Consultative Council. She felt her exclusion from the council keenly, wrote Marilyn Lake in her authorised biography of Faith. It was at about this time in the early 1970s that Faith became active in the emerging radical women's movement. Earlier, she had been a member of the Union of Australian Women, the UAW, a left-wing organisation formed in 1950 that had directed its energies to working class women's needs and had campaigned on national and international issues, including Aboriginal rights and anti-apartheid. The UAW, for all its important work, must have seemed decidedly stodgy when women's liberation arrived. The focus on personal emancipation, combined with an aggressive pursuit of rights to abortion, contraception and other confronting issues was liberating and energising 
for many women in the early 1970s. In 1972, the Women's Electoral Lobby, Well, was formed. It was the more moderate sister to women's liberation, set up to campaign for more immediately achievable goals, or so we thought, such as equality in education and pay, childcare services, and bottom line issue, safe and legal abortion. Faith Bandler was an early joiner of Well. She was in her mid-50s, a good generation older than the majority of Well members who were in their 20s, although not all of them, a few were even older than she was. Faith became fast friends with Edna Ryan, then in her late 70s, a veteran feminist and trade unionist. And she had as peers women like Joan Bielski and Dorothy Simons, who were closer to her in age. One of the things about Well was its easy embrace of women of all ages and backgrounds, and Faith felt right at home. Faith was also on the board of Sisters, a feminist publishing company in Melbourne, and on the board of the Women's College here at the University of Sydney. In 1984, she was one of four women who took part in a televised debate on the subject of different concepts of women's liberation at the London Book Fair. Faith's feminism was broad, encompassing involvement in many issues she cared about, and it was long-lasting. It was part of who she was. Until two years ago, Faith had never missed the annual lunch started in 1989 and held each year in New South Wales Parliament House to honour Jessie Street. Faith had learned about politics from two experts, both of them women. Pearl Gibbs was one, the other was Jessie Street. Pearl Gibbs was an Aboriginal woman who is best remembered for being the driving force behind the National Day of Mourning on the 26th of January, 1938, the sesquicentenary of Governor Phillips Landing. In the mid-1950s, she encouraged the young Faith Mussing into active Aboriginal politics. Jessie Street, the famous feminist, was another who saw the potential in Faith and who became her active mentor. We hear a lot about Faith's relationship with Jessie Street. We know, of course, of Jessie Street's famous admonition to Faith to just go and do it, telling her to get the 1967 referendum up and running and passed, which, of course, she did. Faith always acknowledged Jessie's astute political skills. Jessie knew how to organise, and this was a skill she passed on to her young mentee, who in turn educated a generation of young women and Aboriginal people on how to make things happen. My enduring memory of Faith from early well days was how wise and seasoned she was, well member Helen Narong told me at the weekend. We were rather naive activists and she gave us very sound advice about how we should run campaigns, approach pollies and so on. But Faith also learned something else from Jessie Street, and that was the importance of women having a political voice. Jessie was, of course, the only woman member of Australia's delegation to the conference in San Francisco in 1945 that established the United Nations. Only 1% of the delegates to that conference were women. Women were not allowed to speak during the plenaries, and no women were involved in the policy-making sessions of the conference. Despite these hurdles, Jessie Street and the other women delegates succeeded in ensuring that sex discrimination was outlawed in the United Nations Charter, so we can thank her for Australia's Sex Discrimination Act many years later, and that women would be eligible for all jobs at the UN. This example of working from a position of disadvantage was not lost on faith. Faith has always been characterised as a gentle activist. Indeed, that is the title of Marilyn Lake's 2002 biography of her. But Wendy McCarthy remembers her from the early days of Well as passionate and feisty. Faith could be angry, and she has written about her bitterness, about how hard it was to gain political recognition and understanding for South Sea Islanders. That campaign ran parallel to her work for women, in some cases, her women's work intersected with her work with women of colour. Faith, was, for instance, was active in Wells' campaign for abortion law reform in the 1970s, but she was especially concerned that Aboriginal women would have access to safe legal terminations. 
In the 1980s, she was involved in Aboriginal women's health centres. Above all, Faith, the feminist, was an activist who understood politics. She knew how to campaign and she knew how to win. And she knew that she and we had to be there if we were going to make things happen. As Faith said in her memorable 1999 speech, Faith, Hope and Reconciliation, if not now, when? If not us, who? Thank you. Well, thank you, Anne. We're again going to hear from our wonderful singers. This time, they will sing for us The Parting Glass. Thank you. Our final tribute comes from Lilon Bandler. Lilon is, of course, Faith's daughter. She suggested, uh, however, I just introduce her today by saying she had known Faith Bandler for 60 years. <laughs> she will share those 60 years with her mother, Faith, with us now. Dr. Leland Bandler. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
Today we are here paying respects to and acknowledging Faith Bandler. And I'd like to begin as one usually finishes by paying my respects to and acknowledging and thanking the people who were so kind to her, particularly in the last stages of her life. My thanks go first to my family, my children, Nicola and Olivia. Having lived through the depression, my mother was particularly addicted to turning off all the switches, all the time. There were many curses when toast remained bread. So I thank you for your forbearance and for helping me to care for Faith while she continued to live in her own house and later in our own home, and as she grew more dependent on us. And Stephen, early in our relationship, Faith decided that Stephen was wonderful. He loved the same music she did, and his great uncle, Ernest Llewellyn, had been the concertmaster of her beloved Sydney Symphony Orchestra. Importantly, he had the right politics. He could be trusted, and was therefore invited to dinner. <laughs> As the evening wore on, my shy friend Stephen touched my arm, quietly asking me to check the hot chocolate drink that Faith had made. The rest of us were drinking coffee. In her haste to return to the conversation, she had used a similarly coloured gravy powder instead of chocolate. <laughs> and it was foul. They were firm friends thereafter, and Stephen, you were always her favourite son-in-law. The more astute amongst you will realise I risk nothing saying this, as I am a once married only child. She loved you, Stephen, and put to rest all the assumptions that people make about mothers-in-law. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank Faith's care of these past few years, Kate. She helped Faith transition through each of the stages of her life following the death of my father, and as she did so, she helped all of my family, including me, through each of them too. Her unfailing kindness, her patience, her optimism, her good humour, and her common sense has sustained us all, and I will always be grateful and forever in your debt. And I would like to thank all of those who have written to me spoken in public and privately about faith and who have tweeted, messaged and emailed. And I thank you, all of you who have come here today, all of you listening elsewhere and those of you who listen in the future. Now I have a question for you. Why are you here? Why are we marking the death of this particular 96-year-old woman? I've always been amazed by the number of you who would approach her in the street and who have been so pleased to meet me as her daughter. And over the last few days in particular, I've been touched by how many of you sent or posted messages or have spoken privately and publicly and told of a time you met Faith or saw her or heard her, often many years ago, and you described the impact that had on you. What was it that affected you? I want to take a moment to reflect on some of the pivotal influences in Faith's life to try and tease out the waft and the weft of this life and so find answers to this question. My father, Peter Mussing, was kidnapped and brought from Vanuatu, New Hebrides as it was, to work as a slave on the Queensland cane farms. Faith always spoke of him as a storyteller and as a narrator. And I have no doubt that some of those early stories were about where he was taken from, what he was taken from, how he was taken, and how he survived and escaped. I think that the courage and resilience in those early stories marked my mother for life. His story was her early example of what I call life theft. One is snatched from a life and a family that were precious and kind and good. And he was also her first example of quiet, graceful strength. Faith was born in 1918. 
It is a mark of her age and the changes that have occurred over all those decades that she described for me going to school by horse and having a midwife come and stay at the house for the duration of the confinement, which was a month, filling the house with baked breads, cakes and biscuits, as well as delivering the baby. My mother grew up on the north coast of New South Wales, and for those of you who don't know it, it is some of the most beautiful country in the world. Like most people of her age, she was indelibly marked by her experiences during the Great Depression. I remember her describing people coming to their home seeking food, shelter, work, and her mother, a generous and compassionate woman, would ask them to chop some wood. And then she would give them a spoon to take out to their pineapple crop, and they could pick a pineapple, sit in the sun, in the field, scooping out the flesh. Later in Sydney, she was living in the house of Margaret Newbican in Taramara, and she would describe for me the young men who came to the house to seek work chopping and stacking wood or gardening or any other tasks that would earn them some food. She particularly recalled the conversation with one of them, an architect, and she was always concerned that I should understand that being professionally trained would not protect me should we ever have a depression like that again. I needed to understand that thrift, no debt to those robbers, the banks, a sense of self-reliance and resourcefulness were essential, and that hardship could be softened by compassion and by generosity. Faith was one of nine children with two stepsisters, and she was very close to her sister Kate, especially when they both came to Sydney. When the war came, Faith and Kate joined the Women's Land Army, and World War II changed everyone's life and everyone's perception of the world, and their understanding of the extent of what could happen in a world based on violence and racism. And much of the world was profoundly changed, and so was faith. I remember her standing in Central Railway Station in Sydney. It's a huge cavernous space, and she described the scene when it was full of khaki at the end of the war as people were demobbed. And that war instilled in her a sense of outrage at injustice the injustice of unequal pay based on gender or on race, the terrible scourge of poverty that is left in the wake of war, the effect of war on an old culture, and the devastation of people it leaves behind. My father spent 12 months in concentration camps in Buchenwald and Dachau, and he left Austria in 1939 with his much younger stepbrother, whom he left in the care of the Quakers in London. And he came to Australia as a refugee, where his poor English was laughed at and he was scorned as a refo. When my parents met, they shared two things. The first was love of music. They loved going to concerts, large and small. They loved listening to music together, their own or on the radio. And my mother could sing. She had a beautiful soprano voice and I learned to play the piano as her accompanist. She would sing, standing at my right shoulder, bless this house, the Lord's Prayer, Guten Morgen, Schöne Müllerin, and confuse her young accompanist by owning the rhythm in a way that I struggled to understand. Minims became crotchets, and pauses were unpredictably long or short. The second thing they shared was a deep sense of commitment to peace and pacifism, to political activism and to justice. One of my earliest memories of Sydney's Martin Place is being in a rally with them, walking up and down chanting, ban the bomb, negotiate, because war was not how you solved things and not how you changed the world. You must do that through legislation, through political activism and through consciousness raising. My mother, together with my father and their friends, had the idea that it is possible to put this world right. They had a belief that you can have a better society if people are united and are influenced by the wish to avoid the horror of war. That humanity has to live with each other, we have to look after each other and make sure that if you have more, you should share. 
and that if someone comes to you in need, you should share what you have at a personal level and as a government. My mother had learned from her father and her mother that you had to fight for what was right and for what was just and that you had to stand up for people who couldn't fight their own battles. Of course, they understood that political action wasn't always welcome and they knew that their political activity was scrutinised and records kept. My parents would joke about the clicks we could hear on the phone, talking quite civilly to those they knew were listening in. My parents built a house in French's Forest. My father was a civil engineer who worked for what is now Sydney Water. Back then it was called Metropolitan Water Sewerage and Drainage Board. And he was a design engineer. He drew the plans for our house and they did most of the building themselves. There are wonderful photographs of them both with hammer and nails as the frame of the house slowly took shape over the weekends. I think it is a mark of her extraordinary love and patience that she could laugh when she told the story of Hans returning to their North Sydney flat one Saturday evening. She inquired after progress and my father explained that he'd been laying bricks and he had the measure of it now that he had laid 27. <laughs> the house took five years to build. <laughs> Fortunately, they had many friends who came to help including some more skilled at bricklaying, or construction may even have been slower. My parents were married in June 1952 and moved to French's Forest when the house was finished. There is a note in her ASIO file that on the 20th of December 1955, or perhaps 1957, it's hard to read, and it says, Hans and Faith Bandler held a party for Father Alf Clint at their home in French's Forest. There were about 17 present, including Reverend Clint, and they mentioned Bill Rigby and Bert Groves and some unidentified neighbours. I've always had a secret gratitude for ASIO's careful notation about my mother's early life. Because I can picture this. My mother sitting with Alf on one side and my father on the other, enthralling her visitors with her tales of travel and humanity, good things and bad, and she was a great cook. She made the best baked custard and divine slow-cooked quinces. Cooking for a group of friends, she would always make something that didn't need her to do anything other than serve once her guests had arrived. She hated missing out on the conversation or the singing or the laughter. My mother took her stories and her father's oratory ability with her around the country. In our Holden car, my mother would travel the country, talking at town hall meetings, talking in churches, talking to VIEW clubs, that's V-I-E-W, stood for Voice, Interests and Education of Women. And there must have been a lot of VIEW clubs because they were kind enough to give her a teaspoon each time. <laughs> and we had a lot of VIEW club teaspoons. And I still have one today. And she was wily, my mother. She was talking about the need for change. She knew that women would give her voice and that women would pass on what she was saying. She was talking about the inhumanity of conditions under which, which Australian Aboriginal people lived. And she knew that women would understand the importance of bringing about that change. And she knew and often said that there are none so pious as the converted, none so passionate about a cause as those who have come to it recently. So she worked to convert. She would dress to perfection in her handmade suits. The sound of big, sharp scissors cutting a length of material on the dining room table is incredibly evocative for me. When she was cutting the material, she would save a piece and her friend Gretel, who was a milliner, would take that piece and make her a hat to match. She would wear gloves. It was the 1950s and 1960s. And she was so graceful and so beautiful. She never pretended or tried to be anything other than what she was. And her actions and behaviour in public were impeccable. Though she could swear at home, she was completely unsympathetic when I was in trouble at school for doing the same thing, but in public. <laughs> she was disdainful of fools and snobs 
and yet would speak to everyone as though they were the most important person in the world. She took that grace with her when she went to speak to high school students and their teachers and to speak to prime ministers as they watched the first water flow into the Lake Burley Griffin. And she made everyone understand that this was their fight too. Please, don't think that we're talking of a saint here. She was mischievous, funny, and intolerant of ignorance and foolishness. In the recent past, we'd taken to doing the Sydney Morning Herald quiz most Sunday mornings when we gathered for breakfast at her house, and she would be seemingly uninterested, but would suddenly chime in with an answer. On one occasion, she recited in full The Man from Snowy River with my daughter. And she was quite unconcerned that we didn't completely trust her memory when she confidently answered that the last book in the Bible was the book of Revelations. She knew we were ignorant fools. Faith was gracious and she was passionate. And that passion was based on a love of humanity, a love for ordinary human beings. And she had the knack of making everyone who met her, who heard her or who watched her feel special. She would make you feel so welcome when you came to her house. She was generous, yes, materially, but she had an open heart, an open and generous spirit. You walked in the front door and she made you feel that everything was going to work out. She had that great optimism and it was infectious. She told the Australian people that this is what they should do and she was grateful, gracious and gentle, but she was absolutely persistent. She never let you doubt that this was the right thing to do. She never believed that you would do anything less. And her whole demeanor just assumed you saw the innate reasoning behind her stand. She helped us all to be better people, helped us to recognize that caring for others was fundamental to our reason for being on earth, that we ought to get on with it, we ought to work hard to improve the life of every single human being, regardless of race or religion, gender or geography. And this is no time for shilly-shallying, as she would say. It's time to stand up, as she did, not to serve her own needs, her own ends, her career or egocentric perceptions. It's time to be courageous in our defense of human dignity, social justice, human rights, equity, compassion, and respect. I think that these are the strands that are the waft and weft of faith's life. There is her knowledge of hardship, oppression, and racism. There are the markers of how she lived her life with generosity, friendship, and courage. There is her absolute commitment to justice, to peace, and to equal rights for each person alive. Supported by her unfailing compassion, her pacifism, and her understanding of the importance of unity or working with like-minded friends. In a moment, we will listen as Faith often did, right to the very end, to the singing of another great activist, Paul Robeson. And as you go home, take Faith with you and work hard to change the world to make it a better, more just, more inclusive, and less violent place. Do it by gathering others to work with you, and remember, faith could move mountains, and she knew that you could too. And I'd like to finish, as I usually start when speaking, by acknowledging country. Acknowledging that we stand, we teach, we learn, we speak, we listen and we think on Aboriginal land. And we pay our respects to elders past and elders present. And I pay my respects to my mother, Faith Bandler. Thank you. Thank you, Leelam. 
Faith Bandler was part of a generation of Australians who knew the want of the Great Depression and the dangers of the Second World War. She was one of the many Australians who knew the deprivations of segregation and the bitter consequences of racial discrimination. And she was one of those fearless few who in those early years dedicated their lives to eradicating the evils of racism and ameliorating its legacy. In those crucial early years, she served as a calm bridge between a hesitant middle Australia and an indigenous community clamouring for change. Some were even foolish enough to think her manners and winning smile were signs of weakness. Faith was charming and intelligent, but she was determined. She combined, as we've heard today, grace with power. During her life, till the end of her days, she remained loyal to her belief in humanity, confident that persuasion, passion and reason would overcome bigotry, insularity and fear. Her faith was not in any colour or creed, but in people. Faith believed in people. She believed in us. And that is why so many of us have gathered here today to honour this very great Australian. Ladies and gentlemen, could I ask you to stand as we say farewell?
Jacob, there's no end, just a living on. 